So uh, today I'm going to be presenting over uh, my uh, PhD research that I did uh, with my advisor, and um, all of this was in heavy collaboration with my practicum advisor, Mihai. Um, so before getting into the meat of things, uh, I think it's important to kind of put context on all this uh, and really narrow down what kind of simulations we're talking about. So for all of this, kind of my focus is um, what is kind of known as engineering simulations. Uh, so the goal of an engineering simulation is to characterize the performance of some system that we're interested in, let's say an aircraft or a nuclear reactor, um, and we're going to characterize that performance based on uh, some relative, relevant physics. So we can think of our simulation as just mapping design parameters and model parameters to some output that, that we're interested in uh, that we're going to use as a basis for a design uh, using the governing equation, usually PDEs in this context. Uh, and I um, want to distinguish engineering simulation specifically from uh, what I'd call scientific stimulation, uh, where your goal is to figure out what's going on. For an engineering simulation, we know roughly what's going on. We just need to come up with an actual number. <clears throat> now, where engineering simulation um, is incredibly important for as a design tool is when experimental data is uh, really expensive and impractical to obtain. Um, so if you are designing a new uh, atmospheric reentry vehicle, if you're designing a new reactor, if you're designing a new plane, um, you can't afford to test every design um, experimentally. So of course, um, we have to, you have to make decisions based on simulations. And when you're making decisions based solely on uh, simulations, you have to account for the uncertainty of the simulation. Uh, so, you know, if if you've done that properly, you then can apply some sort of confidence interval to your result uh, for the purposes of certification and reliability analysis. Uh, you can identify the limitations of your simulation, so you can uh, figure out which of your design parameters need to be buttoned down with a high degree of precision. And of course, you can uh, start incorporating. Uh, uncertainty into the design process. You can start uh, putting in uh, reliability constraints uh, as, as one of your goals uh, in designing a new product. Um, so traditional approaches for uncertainty quantification, of course, rely on exhaustive sampling. And for any sort of reasonable simulation, it's prohibitively expensive. Uh, so if we want to be able to use uncertainty quantification throughout the whole design process for engineering systems, uh, you need to be able to reduce its cost. So a few characteristics of engineering simulations that kind of work in our favor um, in the case of uncertainty quantification is that um, typically the number of inputs we have, so in this context, I'm going to define inputs as uh, the parameters that define our design that we're interested in, as well as the parameters that our models need in order to uh, come up with a solution. Uh, typically, that number is uh, a lot larger than the number of simulation outputs that we're actually interested in. If I'm designing a new airfoil, lift and drag and moment coefficients is really what I'm interested in. And uh, a lot of the details of the simulation, although they're important to get to that point, I uh, don't really need that much uh, knowledge about. Um, now, one nice thing, uh, because our governing equations are PDEs, uh, the, these simulation outputs that we're interested in typically vary smoothly as a function of our input parameters. And because of that, we uh, can use gradient information, that is the derivative of our output with respect to our inputs, uh, to give us more information at reduced cost. Because if we use an adjoint technique, which I'll get into uh, soon, uh, we calculate the derivative of a single output with respect to all of our inputs. Uh, in a uh, constant amount of time, and that amount of time is proportional to the cost of our simulation. So it's essentially free information. Um, and another nice thing is that adjunct capability is increasingly uh, becoming available in a lot of commercial CFD solvers. Uh, now, their purposes are for error estimation and optimization. Um, however, uh, you know, can we use it to leverage, uh, to uh, reduce the cost of uncertainty quantification? And um, that the answer is, is yes, based on this work. Um, so that, that's the goal, is to uh, use this gradient information that we're going to get probably anyway and start using it for uh, more novel uses. Uh, so kind of an overview of what exact problem I'm looking at is uh, hypersonic fluid flow. So it's roughly defined as a Mach number greater than 5. Um, it's you know something you'll see in aerospace applications. Uh, so my specific focus is on 
atmospheric reentry. So it's the kind of flow that the space shuttle used to see when it was coming in uh, from orbit. Uh, it's characterized by strong shocks leading to extreme uh, temperatures and pressures. Uh, internal energy modes of the molecules start becoming uh, active, and um, you know you have to start modeling the dissociation of the molecules uh, because of all this uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics that's happening. Uh, the models that are used to uh, uh, to characterize all these physical phenomena um, have hundreds or thousands of parameters, uh, and most of those are experimentally determined. So, how do we propagate that to our uh, design output? Uh, so, the equation that we're solving are the Navier-Stokes equations, um, which are uh, which are deterministic. However, um, they you know to solve it for these kind of flows, we have all these ex these extra terms and considered relations that depend on our model parameters, and that's where the uncertainties come in. So just uh, the test case that I'm going to be using throughout this entire work is uh, that of a five kilometer flow over um, a blunt body, in this case a, a cylinder. Um, so it's a five species two temperature model, and um, I wrote the solver uh, from scratch simply because I had to add the adjoint into it. Uh, and so integrated surface heating is uh, always my objective, even if I don't necessarily uh, state it explicitly. <laughs> and so you, here you can kind of see what the flow looks like. So you have the flow direction comes in here. You have this nice bow shock in front of the cylinder. Um, here's the plot of surface heating. You can see I agree with the NASA code pretty well. So uh, you know the code is decent, I suppose. Um, so OK, so what does uncertainty quantification mean in the context of hypersonic uh, flow? So there are multiple places where uncertainty could enter into our uh, into our simulation. The specific sources that we're going to be look at in this uh, that I always looked at were um, the uncertainty in the physical parameters as well as the uncertainty in the boundary conditions, mainly the uh, uncertainty in our incoming flow conditions. Uh, now, because I'm solving Navier-Stokes equations and they're deterministic, uh, our out my output is only uh, uncertain in the context of uncertain inputs. Uh, so we can represent our simulation just as a mapping, and I'm going to call it F. Um, of inputs to outputs, and if we sample the multiple inputs and we run our simulation, we then can build up a distribution on L, on the objective L. Um, so, because we have a deterministic simulation, um, and because it's just this uh, mapping, we should be able to use the gradient of the objective to accelerate everything. And how do we get that objective cheaply? Uh, so we do that through an adjoint uh, approach. And so um, if we assume a functional dependence of our model parameters d, and then we have our solution variable, um, we can differentiate it. We can um, start substituting from our constraint uh, relation, which is just that uh, we have to solve the governing equations into our objective linearization. And we can get a uh, forward, and then uh, a consequence of the forward uh, sensitivity equation will be the, the, uh, tra the adjoint sensitivity equation. Um, so basically what this is, it calculates the total derivative of our objective with respect to uh, our inputs. Um, for the forward sensitivity equation, you can see that we have this uh, inversion of our um, Jacobian, and this Jacobian represents the uh, derivative of our residual, which is the number of unknowns with respect to our uh, number with the, with respect to our solution variables, which is also the number of unknowns. So it's a big matrix, and this inversion is expensive. And for the forward sensitivity equation, we have to do it for each design variable. Um, since we have a lot of those, that's way too expensive. So we can transpose the entire process. Um, now we have to uh, invert uh, the inverse of the transpose onto this vector that is only dependent on, on our uh, objective and not our design variables. So with a single flow adjoint, we can calculate all the derivatives, all the components of the gradient that we're interested in um, in uh, a constant amount of work. Uh, and these derivatives that are needed throughout all this are calculated very easily through automatic differentiation tools. I specifically use a tool known as Tappanid. Uh, so a nice thing about adjoints for hypersonics is that the adjoint equation is, non -lin is, is linear while the flow is highly nonlinear. So the adjoint solves really, really fast. Uh, so it's about 40 times faster than the flow solves. So we're getting all this gradient information. It's essentially free. Now how can we use it? Um, so before specifics on how we use it, you have to talk about the different forms of uncertainty that can come up in these problems. Uh, so you have uh, aleatory uncertainties, which are due to inherent randomness in our input parameters. Um, they're specified with a probability distribution function. And these are straightforward to, to uh, quantify. You just have to do Monte Carlo sampling. 
thousands to 10,000 simulation realizations, um, and you can build up a decent distribution. Um, epistemic uncertainties uh, are a little more complicated. So epistemic uncertainties represent the lack of knowledge about the exact value of our parameter, and they're specified by an interval. So we don't know anything about that interval, we just know our parameter is somewhere inside of it. Uh, and because we have so little information, we have to quantify it just through uh, exhaustive sampling, and you just have to go through all the different combinations of the variables that could exist. Uh, and so this scales incredibly poorly as the number of parameters D increases. And then, of course, you can have mixed form uh, where you have some variables with epistemic and some with aleatory, and you have to do a nested approach, and that's also incredibly expensive. Uh, now, we leverage gradient information in different ways for each. Uh, so for aleatory uncertainty quantification, our goal is just to determine the output distribution. Um, now, a lot of other works uh, in this context will use uh, a surrogate-based approach. So because our simulation is just uh, this mapping, we can come up with an approximate mapping that's built on a limited number of simulation results that uh, we can then interrogate uh, to, pick, to uh, determine our output distribution. Um, and so there's a lot of different forms of what this approximate mapping can, can be. You could do interpolation around points. You could do polynomial regression. Uh, I focused on Gaussian process regression. Um, now, the problem with surrogate-based approaches is that the cost increases exponentially fast. The cost of training increases exponentially fast. As, so as we want to look at the uncertainty of more model parameters, it gets more and more expensive to make this surrogate. Uh, now, you can start truncating dimensions, but the main focus here is Okay, well, if we incorporate gradient inf information as we expand the dimension, we also get more information. So we should be able to use it to uh, reduce the cost of constructing the surrogate. So how much does, help, does adding gradient information into a surrogate help? Uh, so these are flight envelope calculations uh, done courtesy of my good friend Wataru uh, Yamazaki. Uh, so this is uh, lift and drag as uh, a function of Mach number and alpha. And so here, the white spheres are where the simulation was actually performed, and then the surface is the approximate Krieging uh, surface. And you can see you, we do decently approximating the exact uh, envelope over here, but if you add gradients, suddenly um, it, the agreement looks a lot better. And uh, we didn't substantially increase the cost of making this uh, surrogate. So can we do the same thing in the context of UQ? And the answer is, uh, is yes. So I did this for the five kilometer flow problem. Uh, so here I have two uh, CDF functions, essentially indistinguishable from each other. One is based on Monte Carlo sampling with 5,000 simulation results. The other is based on a Krieging model that used only 68 function gradient evaluations. Um, and I employed some uh, dimension reduction to, uh, to further reduce the cost. Uh, so we went from 5,000 simulations to just running the code 68 times. Um, uh, you know, so this starts enabling aleatory UQ for, um, you know, earlier in the design process. Epistemic uncertainty, uh, like I said, a little, uh, little more complicated, but it's also the dominant form for hypersonic flows, uh, because you have a lot of parameters that really you just can't say anything about. Um, so uh, what we've chosen to do in this case is to cast it as a bound constrained optimization problem. Uh, so basically, I have input, input intervals, and now I need to determine the minimum and maximum values uh, of my output, and those are essentially my uh, worst case scenarios. That's, that's my plus and minus. Um, and because it's an optimization problem, and because we have a gradient, uh, we can use gradient-based optimization to reduce the cost. Uh, so here I've got a, a you know, demonstration problem, looked at uncertainty in just eight dimensions. Um, so the dashed lines here are the bounds that would come from just doing exhaustive sampling, and then the um, blue curve here is the convergence of my optimization. Uh, and so you can see I've got a uh, bounds that I argue are the correct uh, bounds uh, for this, this solution. And um, I went from requiring over 6,000 function evaluations to about 40 function gradient evaluations. Additionally, the scaling of this problem has been in, improved dramatically. So before with exhaustive sampling, we had exponential scaling. Now, provided this local optimization holds for even uh, larger dimensions, we've reduced it to um, you know, more of a linear scaling uh, in terms of difficulty. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, problems of mixed form. So in this case, your goal is to give an interval-valued probability, uh, in which case uh, you have to kind of combine the two approaches. So uh, what we've done is we run multiple 
optimization results at different aleatory values, and then you uh, can create a surrogate over those. And so here, these, ex these scale incredibly fast, uh, ex uh, scale incredibly poorly, traditional methods do. Um, so for nested sampling approach, we required 30 million samples to produce these, these curves, uh, while the combined optimization and surrogate approach um, enabled us to capture these bounds with about 500 function gradient evaluations. Uh, and so here we were able to uh, you know, really solve a uncertainty quantification problem where traditional methods are just intractable for any sort of realistic calculation. So in conclusion, uh, I've shown uh, uh, during my, uh, my research and time on the fellowship, I uh, developed different strategies for all the different forms of uncertainty that you can encounter during hypersonic fluid flows, and shown that gradient information can be quite powerful in reducing the cost uh, associated uh, with these problems, and in some cases, uh, it makes it so uncertainty quantification is actually possible, as opposed to um, you know traditional approaches where you just can't do it. And so, I'd like to acknowledge um, the support of my advisor at the University of Wyoming. Uh, obviously, the support of the uh, everybody associated with the CSGF program and the Krell Institute, and of course, uh, my collaborator at Argonne, Mihai. Uh, any questions? <laughs>